Okay, I think we have like 10 or 15 minutes for comments and questions from the audience. So um, if anyone has anything to ask or to address any of the participants, raise your hand now or forever, something. <laughs> yes, please. Louis, state your name and... My name is Louis, I work for Rabbis for Human Rights. Um, I think that today we heard a, a number of uh, ways of addressing ourselves, who we are, whether we're Jewish or whether we're Palestinian, whether we're working for human rights, whether we're human rights defenders. I think the quintessential definition of a human rights defender was made by the Supreme Court about obscenity. You know one when you see it. Um, we're, they're all the people who are here, they're the people who are in, uh, who are out in the West Bank today in, um, in uh, Kusura, who are being shot at by the, by, um, the security forces. It's the 48-year-old the man who was shot um, a few days ago by um, radical settlers. They're human rights defenders. I think that we heard what I would say are sort of a sociological definition or ontological definition of who we are as human rights defenders. I think in a lot of ways in our society today, we need to look at ourselves in a sort of a more religious um, understanding of who we are or who you are as human rights um, activists and defenders. We're heretics. We live in a highly religious society and looking at your grandfather's works were the strangers, were the, the outsiders that he spoke about in his works on liquid modernity. Um, we are heretics, why? Because Israel's become a highly ultra-Orthodox religious society and that's the religion of the occupation, and that in this sort of orthodoxy of the occupation, the high priests of the occupation will do whatever they can. They will sacrifice whatever they can. They will sacrifice democracy to preserve the occupation. And those people who shout out against it, those people who against this sort of system, were heretics, and heretics are dangerous. And in a society built on ultra-orthodoxy of human rights repression, we will remain um, in danger. But the people that we try to, re to, to protect, the people living under occupation, are always more in danger. And that's something I think that, that's what I think about when I think about what we heard about today, the, the different planes of reality that were reflected today. Thank you. We'll hear two or three more comments. Vigain from the New Israel Fund. Um, I agree with you, Yael, with what you say um, about being less suspicious and, and, and enclosing more, more struggles. But I have to say that in the reality in which the human rights activist and organization operate, this can also be dangerous sometimes. Um, and, we and, and Yuli has um, mentioned some examples in which from coming and, and, and being open and, and inclusive, um, there were people who infiltrated into, into breaking the silence. So I think it's, it goes on, and, 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 I, and I, I think w we deal with it all the time, the spectrum in which you want to include and, and, and work with as many groups and as many people as, as you can. And on the, other, on the other side, this is the, we are in a new normal in which there are attempts to, to, to investigate and filtrate and spy over um, human rights organizations and activists. Thank you. Yeah, any other comments, questions? Sandra. Uh, hi, my name is Nili Venezia from the Israel Social TV. Uh, and um, I would like to, uh, I've there is always this question um, that bothers me, how can we be helped as uh, human rights organizations? And we are the current um, organization that I'm, I'm sure many of you know all the hassles of the government and the uh, right-wing organizations. Uh, but uh, since we are a social media, uh, I think that, um, mm, the efforts to silence every visibility 
of any human rights organization is now taking place in a very severe way. And I think that, um, uh, Yuli, you mentioned before solidarity. I will take it with two hands and call you and ask you to use social media and to enlarge your voices and, and visibility so as much as they try to shrink us, we must enlarge our voice. And I don't know what will be the answer of how can we be helped as uh, human rights uh, protectors, but we need the uh, energy and the resources to, uh, <laughs> I even don't know how to say it, to have a, a very, very loud voice that people will need to hear us. Thank you. I have two more comments and then I'll... I, I, I hear can, what can you're saying. Ah, sorry, yes. Yourself. Angela Godfrey Goldstein working with Bedouin uh, in the Jahalin Solidarity since the 90s, four years in Sinai. Uh, during which time I was going up to Cairo and warning the diplomatic community, 1998, that the Bedouins say they will start blowing up pipelines if nobody will help them. And that was something I started, not because I particularly wanted to, but there was nobody else to do it. <laughs> and I think that that's something that probably binds a lot of us in this room, is we care. And the question I have, and I think maybe we need more workshops on this even, but it's something that came up very strongly in what you were saying, Yuli, and also in Yael, is what does it take to make people care more? How do we get to a place where our voice is heard, is relevant, is important, and is valuable to the people that, as Louis says, are suffering more probably than us because they are losing their humanity? Um, one of my friends, she died this year. Many people here probably know her. She set up the Norwegian Refugee Council she was doing her PhD at the time on the connection between human rights and neuroscience. Does it have to be just that we're wired that way? Or is there something, something that we can get across to people that actually this is healthy, this is spiritual, it's happy, it's joyful? In South Africa, they had music deliberately during the struggle to oh keep the spirits up. No, in, <coughs> no, we're not yet. No, we're not yet, but they also did dance and they toy toyed at the demonstrations to confuse the army as a means of keeping the spirit up because that seems to be one of the problems we're in today. Um, and, and, and that's it. If, if, if it's feasible to think about taking this conversation further because I think that we've got the basic, you know, we're on the same page more or less. Yes, we need to learn to be more kind to each other perhaps, to understand we're all going through shit here. <coughs> Okay. Um, yeah. I, I'm Terry Bullata. I work with the Swiss Development Corporation. And because I come uh, from the job of uh, diplomatic uh, and uh, international community, I would like also to see any address regarding the role of the states and the international community, as uh, the special rapporteur have mentioned. But unfortunately, we haven't heard any of the commentators regarding the role of the international community in defense of human rights defenders, as I believe we have many representatives of the international community here. How much the international community can play a role in safeguarding the state of Israel and its democracy and its human rights defenders. We and at the end of the day, this to safeguard the whole international community interest in their presence in this region regarding the two-state solution. Thank you. Last comment above you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Uh, Paul Leclerc, French Consulate. Thank you all. Uh, really quickly as a, as a reaction to this question right here. Can you just speak up a little bit? Certainly. Um, so a really quick question that, that I had in reaction to the question right here was uh, that of the difficulty of at outreach to the public of human rights NGOs and defenders, especially since uh, the outreach to the Israeli public is getting more and more difficult the question of uh, extending the outreach to international uh, public uh, versus Israeli public is, is quite 
uh, quite an important question to me, and I would like to have um, our speakers you know, a take on, on this question. That is of uh, which to prioritize, and is it the solution to turn, turn towards international, international community, whatever this community may bring, uh, in, in opposition to uh, an Israeli public that is more and more uh, turning away uh, from those NGOs? Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll take two minutes each. Um, can you address? We'll start the opposite order with Liz first. Um. Thanks so much. I want to try and address the uh, international community yes, and, the, and the issue of uh, suspicion. So what's the problem if right-wingers infiltrate human rights organizations? What's the problem if the, the, the Shabak is listening to every word that is being said? Why is that a problem? What do we have to hide? Now, I know that this is a, a, it's a, ch it's, it's a challenge, but what I'm trying to say is Part of the delegitimization is saying that speaking up is a security threat. As soon as that speaking up is never hidden, then something begins to happen with that. I mean, I know this, Khulud uh, Bada uh, was here, and when we were quite young, um, we, ha we, made, we made this decision to make everything that we did known, everything. We used to blog about things and tell things to people, and, 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 that, and it was almost like a, a natural reaction. You're not going to turn us into terrorists. You're not going to turn us into this. Now, this is really hard, right? How do, how do you do this when everything is geared towards that? What I'm saying is, if we resist the idea that political activism of any kind can be a security threat, it becomes much harder to paint us in that way. Because it's a, it's a Hasbara war, right? So th that's why they're saying that the truth <coughs> or that the truth is, is dangerous or the reports are dangerous. So if we react by saying, you don't turn po political, and no, there is no political activism that is security threat of any kind and, and, and of any side, okay? Um, I also think that if the international community reacts to that and they say, You're not, you cannot equate any political action with the security threat, boom. I mean, boom, right? Because it's preventative detention, that's, that's immediate, but there's all other, there's a whole bunch of other things that, ha that can happen with that. Okay, I think uh, in, in principle I agree that, uh, uh, and we see part of the attacks against civil society is because of the international activism. And, uh, 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 most of the attacks, for example, about Shovrim uh, Shtika is that you can speak about uh, the issues, but you have to speak inside, not in the UN or in, uh, uh, for the international community. So I think it means that international activities and international organs are important for the, for the work. This is the issues that Israel or the government or the uh, establishment or the uh, regime is seeing as a threat. And I think this means that we should emphasize. I mean, we should do more on that, uh, on that line. And here I think we have to think about new strategies to work not just with the same target groups or governments or when we speak about international community, uh, uh, the normal work that we are doing, but to try to, to, to surprise, to do things that we are not used to do and with audience and groups that we are not used to do. And, and, and I think there are a lot of ideas that can go in that, uh, in that line. And of course, there is a clear need to have more solidarity even among the groups themselves. And I think the threat for Shovrim Shtika is an interest for the Arab Association for Human Rights because it's a threat on the values and the, the, the norms that we are working for the norms of human rights, of justice, of democracy. And I think this is the major uh, thing, is also to go by using media and social media to show that the struggle is not just about the space for our work as civil society, but it's a struggle for the values that we are working for. Uh, and by this, to expand the solidarity and the uh, coalitions that work uh, uh, that works, uh, with us. So 
so two quick points, uh, like my predecessors. Uh, on the issue of inter going international, I think it's very effective to go international, but it has to be deployed also very carefully. I, I think you have to be very selective as to who do you want to go to, because sometimes uh, going international could, uh, could complicate your, your standing domestically, and we've seen this. So I think working with governments is very effective. And I think I agree with you, El, that if this is becomes, if, if the treatment of human rights defenders becomes uh, an agenda item in any diplomatic, any diplomatic meeting in which an Israeli state official is involved anywhere in the world, this is going to have a huge impact. Uh, and, and I think working with, uh, with, with, with treaty bodies, with special rapporteurs, this is very effective. Uh, I myself have some doubt as to whether working on college campuses is, is very effective. Uh, I think it may, it may create exactly the opposite reaction domestically and, and may not change. So, so I think we have to be very economic and, and strategic in how we deploy, but, but it's absolutely critical to, to use this, this uh, avenue. Um, and on, on the issue of circling the wagons, uh, l l let me perhaps uh, underscore the point made by, by uh, Yael that uh, human rights defenders is not uh, just a profession. It's not just uh, uh, a way of living. It's not. It, it's also uh, there are specific actions. So there could, there could be people who never do anything in their lives uh, I in connection with human rights. But suddenly they are with. I mean, they blow the whistle, mm -hmm. a and then th for for these purposes they are uh, human rights defenders, and they are entitled to all protections, which are. Uh, associated with, with the status. So I think we, uh, I fully agree that we should have a, an open-ended and not very purist way in which we approach the question of who is our circle of uh, reference. Um, I try to be short. Sure. <laughs> um, I think uh, that uh, Avigal question and yeah, I'll answer, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you were talking about the same thing. Uh, at least from my perspective, there is no threat coming from uh, uh, groups that are more oppressed than me. All right, when I'm talking, I'm thinking about threats to my ability or our ability to work. Um, and again, I, 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 I totally agree with the wide definition of, of human right defenders. I think we're there already. But um, I don't think about uh, uh, groups that are more oppressed than me. I think about the stronger uh, uh, groups, the, uh, groups that are way stronger than me, that are in control. Uh, but regarding uh, yeah, your answer, um, you know, I, I, I'll do it very shortly, but uh, probably the one of the hardest day that I had during the last years was the day when we found out that uh, uh, one of our very good friends and colleagues uh, was spying on us for months. And on that day, I... And I recording I, and documenting. Uh, recording with hidden cameras in, in, in our homes, in uh, private conversation, all of that. And the moment I found out about it, I, I, I called all the staff of Breaking the Silence and we sat together in circle. And I had a really hard time to tell them. I was the one who needed to tell them that, you know, Chai, your friend, is not who we thought he is. And I took a deep breath and I just said it. And what happened the next moment, and I knew exactly what will happen, that everybody in the circle did that. Look around and try to figure out who else from their friend is is someone they can trust, and this is the definition of creating paranoia. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the, the second thing I told them, by the way, and this the same conversation, the same um, uh, meeting, I said, take into account that all the things that we have on our computers, all the documents that we have, everything, all the inner conversation is all out now. And it was re relieving in a way. It was to know that. Mm -hmm. But this is the easy part, Yael. Mm -hmm. The hard part was to, to, to talk to people who shared with this guy their personal stories, things that their family didn't know about, mm -hmm. and was afraid to find these stories mm -hmm. on primetime TV. And some of them did, by the way. So, so the, the political and personal, when, you're, uh, when we get to this kind of practices, 
the line between political, uh, po uh, 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 political and personal is really blurring. It's not just what we learned in our first degree in sociology. It, it, it's, it's really, it's in practice. This is what, what's going on. So um, I think, yeah, I am for saying the truth and, and, and be truthful and not to hold back and not to play this political game. I don't think we can play it. We're way too weak in order to play them. I, I let go a long time ago from these political games. But, uh, but there are some practices that as a human being, you cannot stand in front of them and, 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 and we need to think how to, there, these, these are violent, this is violence. It's not, it's not, it's not, um, it's not legit. And, and uh, to be sincere, I don't know how to, to face these kind of practices, but, 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 but we cannot be, um, we need to take them seriously because it's going to be, I mean, I, I have to say just, uh, of course, that whatever I've been to and Breaking and Silence been to is nothing compared to what probably every Palestinian organization in the uh, territories in the West Bank, uh, but also uh, inside Israel went through throughout the years. But uh, um, anyway, this is new practices, at least for us. Um, um, uh, uh, just uh, two things. Uh, one, one about the uh, international uh, uh, community. I, I do agree about the price tags. Uh, again, I think it's two very different things. There is one thing to advocate in front of uh, international officials, and it's another thing to work and advocate in front of the uh, white or to work uh, uh, towards the white public. Uh, and this is part of what Breaking the Silence, for example, but other organizations do in campuses, but also in international media. Um, yeah, we can discuss whether uh, this is uh, uh, beneficial for our struggle or not. I believe it, that it, it is very beneficial. The public uh, opinion, the international public opinion is a crucial uh, uh, thing, uh, but uh, then again, these are two different uh, tactics or, or, or um, strategies, thank you. Um, and uh, the last sentence, it's very, um, it will be very short because I don't know how to answer it. Um, how can we make more people hear us or, or uh, how can we make a voice? Um, I have no idea. I'm sure it's gonna be harder and harder as time goes by. The social media is not the answer because it's all about money and w we have much less money than they are. Um, but anyway, just one thing, to think about, I'm not sure we need to. I'm not sure that what we need to do today is to recruit the white public and to convince them that we are right. Actually, tell you a secret, I'm quite sure that we cannot do it and we will not do it. And the answer of how change will happen here is not by uh, uh, convincing the privileged uh, is Jews, Israeli Jews that they need to uh, uh, change the political situation because uh, it's good for them, and uh, it is. And um, so maybe, again, we need to rethink about tactics, about strategies, not maybe, I'm sure we do. Thank you, sorry. Okay, um, so before, before we leave, um, and thanks to all the panelists, uh, I want to address again the special rapporteur, and thank you again for being here. I think I speak on behalf of all of us here that we're sorry that our government did not invite you, but hey, you're at least welcomed by the good guys. So um, thank you for being here, thank you for all of it, thank you for your being here.